Welcome to the fifth of our online readings in the David Shove Memorial Midstream Reading Series. My name is Don Brunquell. I'm one of the coordinators of the series, which was originated by our friend, the late David Shove. We're glad you can all join us tonight. The readings were organized by David until he passed away over a year ago. And for about 10 years, were hosted by John Colstad in his lovely, funky second floor space on Lake Street. The Zoom chat function will be open during the reading, although the readers will not be following the chat during their reading. Tonight, our readers are Jane Dickerson, Carol Masters, Paul Mattis, and Chris Norbury. I will introduce each of them before they read. First, let me tell you a bit about how this will work after my general introduction. I'll read a brief poem, as David did to open each reading and warm up the audience, especially on those winter months when people ventured out of their warm nests to hear poetry. Now we all stay in our warm nests to hear poetry. I will then introduce the first reader who'll read for 10 to 15 minutes. And during each poet's reading, all microphones except that of the reader will be muted until the end of their reading. And then all the microphones will be open simultaneously for a brief period of reaction, applause, hooting, giving thanks, whatever you're moved to do. I'll then introduce the next reader. We'll all be muted until again, there is a brief period for reaction and so on. At the end of the reading, all of the microphones will be open for about 10 or so minutes. Um, we invite you to stay with us and uh, engage in the kind of Zoom free-for-all that, uh, that happens. It's really a lot of fun. So that's assuming all of this works according to plan. Spontaneous changes by the webmaster are, of course, possible. I do want to mention that tonight's reading will be uh, available in a few days on the Midstream website. So uh, you can just Google Midstream readings and you will find us. So before COVID, it was our tradition to gather before the reading at Milkweed Coffee House at 3822 Lake Street and gather afterwards at Merlin's Rest, 3601 East Lake. Uh, and we encourage you to patronize these great establishments as much as possible in these complex times. So now uh, I'll open today's reading with a poem by Alan C. Fox. It's titled Friends. Many of us had gathered in the room. Unnoticed, I sat on the corner of a sofa. I said, I think we are here to share our stories. Who would like to share their story? A woman said, I have always wanted to fly. Then we shall fly together, another said. And all of us flew together in the room and together we came to rest. So with that, we will move on uh, to the evening's readers. Our first reader is Jane Dickerson, who studied with poets Stanley Plumley and Michael Collier at the University of Maryland at College Park, where she received her MFA. She has taught English at the secondary and college levels, as well as at the Minnesota State Academy for the Deaf in Faribault. Prior to that, she worked many years as an RN. She's the author of the book, The Orange Tree, Early Poems, published in 2015, and has been published in several small magazines, including Says, West End, Ethos, Poetic Strokes, and most recently in Quarantine Journal 5. She won the Amer Academy of American Poets University Poetry Prize while at Maryland, as judged by Ellen Bryant Voigt and first prize in two poetry contests sponsored by the St. Paul branch of the American Association of University Women. In 2019, she attended the Breadloaf Writers Conference in Middlebury, Vermont. Today, she resides in St. Paul after having lived in numerous regions of the Northern and Southern United States. We welcome Jane 
Dickerson. Hi, thank you, thank you, Don, for that lovely introduction. I so appreciate it. And um, I appreciate being here tonight at the Midstream Reading Series. Uh, I wanted to do this for ages, so it's really nice to be part of it this evening. Uh, I, I don't want a, a special hello to my sisters, one in Dallas, and then uh, my other sister and her spouse in Texas. So that's really special. And I was hoping my brother would make it, but I don't see him. And then a few other special friends, and it's really good to have you here. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, I'll start this evening with a poem for Stan Plumley, who was my mentor at Maryland, as Don said. Now that was ages ago. That was 30 years ago. And uh, in the intervening years, I didn't do a whole lot uh, traveling in those numerous areas of the North and South, Southern United States, and uh, raising a couple of children. Uh, anyway, Stan was a remarkable teacher. Uh, we had a rough start, but after that, he became, um, uh, I don't know how to explain it, you know, just kind of a charismatic leader for me, teacher. And um, I'm forever indebted to him. So I've written a poem for him after he died last year. It's called Simply for Stan, 1939 to 2019. Winter, an early jay arrives just outside the window and sets the hanging feeder swaying. The bird steadies, beaks the seed, teeters, then dumps the new snow in a flash of blue. The jay you saw startled, delighted. You hadn't heard or seen one in so long. You'd become a city man, had almost forgotten its sapphire blue. It's Queedle, you wrote, it's complaint. I imagine your bird on a sunny day, the summer you saw it in good light. Although air and sky are its elements, if frightened, one will take to the center of any dense tree or shrub at hand. What took you, you believed, fell like the dust of stars into your mouth, airborne, aerial, floating, falling, fell when you were born and waited with considered patience until you'd lived a long life to show itself as the sidelong crab, also known as cancer, dimmest of the constellations, most cunning. R.I.P. Uh, the second poem is from April, just after COVID began and, and we were all isolated. This Easter, it snowed all day, and we ate takeout ham, collards, and cheese potatoes from the Creole place. Ate in solitude because of the world's isolation. And in the afternoon, watched the 1978 version of Death on the Nile, starring Peter Ustinov, wh whom I mistook for Rod Steiger, the one who put his hand through the filing spindle in the pawnbroker which I saw at the University Theater in the fall of 65 with Paul, the high school exchange student from Luxembourg, with whom I argued passionately about the accepted, though incorrect, usage of it's me. So sure, so American, while he persisted in saying it is I, sincerely and low properly, no matter how hard I tried to convey how uncool it sounded. And I so wanted him to be cool because we were hopelessly straight. And probably because of that stubbornness, he became a doctor. And then the man who wrote letters for a year on that light blue airmail paper and his excellent script after one small shaky kiss on the front step before he returned home who said he hoped one day to marry a girl like me, and perhaps did or didn't, but has left me ever to wonder in this 2020. Uh, one way I've been spending my time 
during this this period here in our lives is to take a bunch of workshops from the Poetry Foundation in Chicago, which is pretty cool. Uh, those are the folks that first published T.S. Eliot back in 19, I don't know, 1912, 14, 15, something like that. And uh, it's a great, it's a great uh, um, uh, institution. Uh, and normally they offer workshops on uh, in person around the Chicago area, but now because of this, they've they have people uh, come to a Google Meet class from all over the world. The last one I was in, someone was there from Helsinki. Someone else was from the Caribbean, other people from out west, um, Ohio. It's amazing. Anyway, uh, it's just a good refresher for me. And I learned something new, and that I'll get to that now. It's a poem called A Hyben. And I, I imagine a bunch of you have heard of it. Um, it's a Japanese form. It begins with a paragraph in the beginning, a prose piece, and then at the bottom, at the end, there's um, a haiku. And uh, let me think, 17th century Japan, I believe. Basho was the first one to bring, to use it. So I'll do this. I'll read this one. It's called Haiben. Oh, and it features a fish. At the murky side pond of the lesser Langton Lake, the day I look for swallows, the dressy tree kind in their blue-black tucks, the ochre-vested barn and the rough-winged, none skimmed the surface nor dove nor soared the way they do, aerialists on tour. But on the other shore, shadowed by prickly buckthorn, stood a bird as sublime as a summer cloud, a great white egret balanced on one black spindle leg with three toes seemingly frozen midair. The yellow disc eye, shiny as a polished gem, watchful, intent. The long neck slipped an inch, then two, before the knife-like beak shot into the water and the orange blade jerked up with a bright orange-red six-inch koi flopping crossways in the vise before being tossed headfirst into the bird's silky gullet. There it lodged for what seemed eternity, bulging the fe feathered neck as it was slowly choked down. In all, a ten-minute affair, and the white cloud floated on. Now for the haiku. This is um, uh, based on a quotation from a, um, a Portuguese poet named Fernando Pessoa, who was born in the 19th century and died in 1935, I think. Thinking, a sickness of the eyes, inessential to knowing how to see. Okay. Then another fish poem, and this is for my sister, Pat. I hope she's still there. I don't, there, do I see her? Oh yeah, there she is, she's waving. Uh, it's called Cemetery. When summer ended, she carried them down the highway in a jar. It was my sister's ritual, the day before we left for home, to carry the goldfish she bought in June fed flakes of rice, watched swim their oval dish, dive beneath their castle gate to carry them down the highway in the August heat to the cemetery where we climbed the mossy steps to the oblong pool, thick and green, and poured them in. Thank you, Pat. Uh, let me see. I have one that did not come from this period of time in the last six months. As you can tell, I like birds quite a bit. Reservoir woods and low light. 
It was our day of the Christmas count, and in the urban park between the reservoir and cemetery, Juke called in a sawwet from his phone, and because the sky was overcast in the hour before dawn, I was able to make it out a clump on a bare branch ten feet, ten feet off. I shone the light on it so both of us could see the little owl and held the beam a moment until Juke said, enough, we'll leave it alone now. Then after breakfast, returned to see what else there was to see, which wasn't much. Spring now in the same woods, searching for warblers in the evening light, but only red wings whistle in the bone dry marsh, its raffia-like weeds trampled flat by dogs and deer. And in the middle of this one-time lake, a stick and limb nest in the only tree, leaf bare and dead for years, holds four new eaglets whose precious heads bob and duck above the tilting mess, which next winter will collapse from the heaviest snowfall recorded. Uh, let's see. And I have one poem for my mother. This did come out of the poetry workshops. It's called Home. My mother's hands folded on her chest as she rests supine, listening to her books for the blind. My own folded when I lie down to sleep, now veined, skin thin like hers, palmate bones showing through. Hers, in her last days on the respirator, folded the same, and in the box at church, her last home. My first home, were folded deep in her belly, I began. And I'd like to finish with a poem for the fall. Uh, this is from the book, The Orange Tree, which uh, Don mentioned. This fall begins with two red leaves outside the window and the sill, where the moss cocoon lay dormant in its jar all last year, the sky cloudless and with each hour, each day, more blue. It starts this way with just the outer leaves, the branch gone red until the limbs in flame the sky, all brightness, and then the tree. This heat in the eye burns clean and clear. Glory is a sign rising from the outstretched hand, lifted in an arc across the face, pulled on fingers splayed, fingers waving, a spirit drawn from the uncupped hand. Two hands show praise, touch twice, unheard, then rise above the head and draw two circles, a single voice. They clap again and again they rise, circling wider, brighter, louder. Outside, the tree a blaze of red, the sky so blue, the branches pull and pull. Each leaf lifts finger-like and luminous touching first the palm and then the open air. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. It's wonderful. Thank you. That was Jane Dickerson. Thank you. And um, Jane, that was great. I said that everyone would be unmuted, but unfortunately, there's no way to unmute everyone anymore. So we all have to thank with gestures. So let's thank Jane. All right. Our next reader is Carol Masters. Carol is yearning to be with live poets again, although she notes the last several months have had their gifts for introverts and other animals. Her publications include The Peace Terrorist, short stories from New Rivers Press in 1994, you Can't Do That, Marv Davidov, Nonviolent Revolutionary, 
from Noden Press in 2009, and Dear Descendant, Poems, also from Noden in 2019. You Can't Do That and Dear Descendant were finalists for the Midwest Independent Publishers Association Book Award in 2010 and 2020. She has been a peace activist and a nonviolent protester and is a grandmother. We welcome Carol Masters. Thank you. I'm so happy to see all of you and thank you for arranging this, Don and, and Paul, who's the technician today. <laughs> Um, I'm going to begin with the title poem from Dear Descendant. Dear Descendant, if you are there, I am trying to tell you, yes, I knew, yes, I cared, I was sorry for the oil coats on fulvous ducks, for the floating islands of trash, for any rivers carrying their dead zones to the Gulf. I knew, but I didn't know how to rise as fast as the seas. Please forgive me. I didn't know how dear you were to be. And another poem, maybe a little bit more cheerful for my children. Um, for their wedding day. If it rains, if the rose is out of time, petals strewn in prodigal adornment on the grass, or lilies are late, bud sealed in their private embroideries, or two lavish columbines spill their belled pockets before your designated day. If it pours and drenched peonies sprawl forlorn as lost handkerchiefs. If any happenstance neglect, as it will, your perfect plans. If it rains, receive the blessings, the bright rings, finger kisses of water on water, drop by drop, love's persistent messages. And um, I have a few poems about protest and the particular protests that I was mostly involved in were against weapons of mass destruction. After the protest, count time. In my jail cell, I wait to be counted. I bow like a sunflower to the sun's small mirrors in raindrops frozen on the window. I've not been outside for weeks. Grass moves without me, shaken in the spring wind. Cloud shadows race the thaw, wrestle with light, trembling as though the buried reached up to touch us. Under the riffled wheat of Kansas, burr-headed blooms of the Dakotas, missiles in their pods, in their bitter baskets, wait to blossom. They're still there shut like buds, we don't speak of them. Um, and another one about some jail time that I spent. This was back in the late 80s, called Fry Cook. Out of the joint until five on work release, Need breakfast, can't go home. No room at the counter except between two large men with patriarchal beards. I slice myself a place, murmur an apology, and we shrink inside our bodies, inside our parkas like yard bags tied at the neck. 
Ah, but the cook takes the oval eggs, twists them open soft, as if his hand were on his love's white thigh, lifts the bowl, forks the suns, stirs a lemon afternoon, cracks a whip of light, lets the eggs leap and slide. At last he turns his knife into the curdled edge and sets their boundaries. His hands dip into water, sees the shredded fleshy potatoes, slap them glistening to the warm secret heart of the omelet, then small gray thumbs of mushrooms, now translucent, translucent red green peppers, now red, now onions, now quicker than words, spoon them to the center, close golden doors left, right, like a triptych. My neighbors smile. Brothers, our hunger for this food is also for the law of his two hands, their articulate dance. Brothers, let us lean together over the work of this artificer, as over the law sway the priests and the rabbis, speaking praise. And one for, um, for my husband who uh, lives at the veterans home. He has advanced dementia. He's been there about a year and I see him every day on, like this on FaceTime. And he, he remembers me. I was going to take a trip this uh, April before COVID, but uh, that didn't that didn't happen. But it's called "What If the Stars." You can't die while I'm away. I'm I imagine rocking you telling you the stars while we sit fire stunned as the evening deepens. Stars come suddenly, hidden until we turn from the blaze. It's so cold tonight, water pale will skin, canyon mist begin to form ice feathers on thick beds of leaves. What if the stars turned on singly with a ping like canning jars cooling in the kitchen. We wouldn't go to sleep until we heard the last one sing. So that was, that was a camping poem. We did a lot of camping when we were younger, sometime with, sometimes with our kids. Uh, I'd like to read another camping poem. Last morning in camp, page 47. Say we have tried and can't come to a conclusion about God or the vultures swinging high over Mississippi. Only see singular splendor in the sudden curve of darkness over the bluff. All night we've listened to the knock of acorns, sounds sweeping the underbrush like the approach of an animal. How can we know what they mean? As well try to imagine the sun from the splintered fire on a spruce bough. There is nothing to say. In a few days, a surgeon will open my left lung. If this were the last time to speak of smoke that lifts the sunlight through trees, the universe asks nothing of us. It is simply poured out, poured out, asks nothing, everything we have. And Uh, something about, uh, I don't know if you can see this page, but it's one of my attempts at a concrete poem. Uh, it's about ants and it 
goes down in a dwindling swarm. Ants call to action. Morning began with birdsong. Cardinal spilling questions over dark as though answers mattered. A squabble of sparrows, percussive not to be ignored. Later, breakfast with ants. Ants meandering as though bewildered on this sugarless plain. Now a dozen ants apparently mapping the area. I remember Ma telling us how to capture ants with candy, to place them gently onto peony bugs. Those tiny mandibles heft five times their weight, yet are soft enough to unfold a flower. So my Buddhistic practice has been to haul candy alive with a thousand feet, claws, to tickle open shut buds. Why do ants not fall when hanging upside down? Except now. Now that crack in my skylight's frame shimmers. A dark, indefinite glisten separates. Now two, three, dots drop. Dozens more advance directionless. Faceted compound eyes see a thousand me's. Hordes swarm. I climb on table, vacuum in hand, me mechanically attack. They drop, attack back, unBuddhist like I swat, dance, retreat to shower. Answer in my hair, clothes, underwear, biting, can't scare them. Frightened, ants secrete substances to warn their fellows. So what would you do, dropped to a warming planet? All around you, wars, bodies broken like promises. God of ants, supposedly unlimited in this world and crash absent. Sisters, insects, awake and use your jaws if you must, but preserve this lively antiness. Okay. And do I have time for one more? Okay. Since uh, it's still baseball season, I'll read fly ball. It's one that's been anthologized in a bunch of places, including um, hummers, knucklers, and slow curves. A fly ball has nothing of flight about it. It's pushed out there, its trajectory absolute as the slap of the bat. But no one has ever seen a ball go into the glove, it's true. Follow the arc unblinking, the slow climb up the last leg of a mountain, the raising of a flag, salute the sure sail home to the cup of the mitt. Suddenly the field breaks up, everyone running the same way. A terrible accident. Christ has landed at International Airport. Your presence is required. No, it's just the game. Over. You missed it. In that last inch, the ball disappears. In fact, there's a moment when the ball never enters the glove. It decides to cock a wing, veer to the south. So long, folks. I'm off on a jet stream, the sweet south wind in my wing pits. We're all going, all U.S. fly balls, going to take off like popcorn, roll down the coast and bloom like migratory monarchs on the furs of Michoacan. No, it's still coming, a single headlight, you below it on the tracks, the ball ballooning, Rides clear as an onion, breaking from its skin, that terrible moon coming. Damn thing never stops, blazing with possibilities. And it's yours. You claim it, whether you want it or not, it will come. What matters is where you are. So.
thank you for being here. And thank you all. You can see everyone expressing their appreciation, Carol. So that was great. Thank you. That was Carol Masters. Our next reader is Paul Mattis. Paul has been writing poetry and essays with varying degrees of success for the last 10 years. Spurred on by a piece being published in the collection Water's Edge in 2012, he became a fixture at the Barbaric Yawp open mic series and has appeared at Carol Conley's readings by Writers Series, Cracked Walnut, and other Twin Cities venues. He is a fervid opponent of even accidental rhymes and believes that almost anything can be fixed, if the weather holds, by a ride in the car with the top down. He lives in St. Paul with his wife, two cats, and an elderly Doberman. We welcome Paul Mattis. Thank you. <clears throat> um, first poem is called The Line Break. There is a tone of voice we use for reading line breaks, non-committal and flat, it does not exist in real life. Anyone who talked like that to the cashier at Starbucks would be tagged as a weirdo, still served coffee, but at a careful distance. It gets worse at the ends of stanzas, becoming a longish pause, a time to digest, and if drawn out too much, makes people wonder if it might be some strange, ambiguous ending, another poem without any proper emotional release. It can easily cause the Starbucks cashier, though her badge reads shift leader, to think about getting the real manager to have you politely ejected. The profit on your grande decaf iced cold press being far less than the damage from freaking out a full line of normal customers. Out on the sidewalk, you wonder if poetry is like life only more so, then why is it reading it aloud often much less so? Perhaps it has something to do with needing to leave so much room at the top of the cup for cream. <clears throat> this is called Monday Morning. <clears throat> Monday morning, me on my bicycle, a dog darts out, me flying. I shout, tuck, roll, my helmet cracks on the ground, a trickle of blood, but flying. A goose egg rising from my leg. Concerned passers-by ask, did the wheels just go out from under you? Dog, I say, standing up, checking for broken things on the bike. Did I mention the flying? Pushing the top back onto the bell. I can fly, I can really fly. Checking for broken things on me, straightening out the handlebars. Not far, maybe four or five feet. It's hard to measure. My elbow is bleeding. The goose egg is swelling. Do you realize it happened? I flew. I took to the air for an instant, <clears throat> but I did it. Oh, too short an instant, but I did it. It's possible for about half a second, though it hurts a lot. And I hope the dog is okay. This is called Elevator. The doors rolled closed, thump. The floor jerked, the motor hummed, the elevator car trembled. I looked at all the black buttons so high up, so confusing. I clenched my eyes and fists tight. I stood in the middle and held the floor with my feet. We had been in the part of the building we weren't supposed to be in. We were exploring the old part. We crept around darkened corners, across shiny, worn floors. Maybe we'd get caught, but sneaking away was so delicious. When we got to the elevator, someone reached up and pushed the button. No, I said, don't do that. Someone will come. The doors opened, lights spilled out. The big kids, they went inside. They pushed all the buttons. 
They pulled me in and ran out. I had told them I didn't like elevators. I had told them I was afraid. You're supposed to tell people when you're afraid. The door jerked again. The doors rolled open and I didn't scream. Articles. <clears throat> Article one. Summers spent with the insides of my pants stuck to my knees. Pants with reinforced knees. Plastic reinforcements you could see from the outsides from the Husky department at Sears. The tag inside reading Husky in gold italicized serif capital letters. They might as well have been neon. Husky dungarees, Husky underwear, synthetic fabrics that bound and pinched and never wore out. You had to outgrow them. Article two, a shiny dark green clip-on tie, two plastic prongs spread under my collar, one black, black plastic hook poking my throat, joyfully yanked free before my foot hits the second step outside the Sunday school door, purposefully dropped on the floor of my closet, dusted off, smoothed flat, and jammed on again next week. Article three, work boots. Steel-toed, lug-soled, eyes for laces giving way to hooks, half a size too small already. In social studies, in English, in math, I resist the urge to take them off and set my toes free. I struggle not to think of their confinement. Insanity lies that way, glorious screaming, equalizing the pressure, escape. But I wait. Pudding. <clears throat> there is a snap, a little orange flash above the glow of the bowl. Seed, I say in a knowing gasp, my throat clenched tight to keep from letting out too much of the smoke. Everyone knows it's a seed, everyone being David and me, but it's part of the narrative like, this is great shit, and why do you use duct tape to make all your pipes, and when does your mom get home? My head is full of pudding butterscotch pudding, waves and swirls that nothing moves through quickly. And man, pudding sounds really good right now. Man, have you got any pudding? What? Give it here. Quit hogging it. You ate a whole bag of ruffles last time. That I did. I giggle like a Saturday morning cartoon character, and I wonder if there's anything I can sneak on the way out. Shit, it's late. Time to go home. I push the basement stairs under me, and David's kitchen appears. I glide through the door outside. Each footstep is fascinating, slow, rhythmic, down streets, around corners, rotating the entire planet like a giant ball. Home swims into view. I grab the railing hard to make the house stop moving. My key works and I'm inside. What's for dinner, I call to mom. I don't hear the answer, heading upstairs before she can see my eyes. This is called Dad. <clears throat> Master of the aluminum stepladder with paint splotches older than me and hinges eager to pinch fingers. Reticent keeper of curse words, begun but never finished. The best driver in the world, hand draped over the top of the wheel, flipped up to check our speed. A man of infinite height with infinitely large feet and infinitely long legs. Expert photographer, measuring the light with his meter, safe in its gray plastic case, then flipping open the top of the twin lens, twin lens reflex at his chest, fiddling, focusing, then clicking the shutter with a remote cable release shooting Kodachrome slides. Occupant of a folding lawn chair in the backyard, a vodka martini, martini in his hand, calling it a Martinez and chuckling to himself. Keeper of the turquoise barbecue grill started with an electric wand with a crank to raise and lower the tray of coals, bending down to kiss my mother in an exaggerated pucker, yelling at my sister in exasperation, showing me how the world works. This one has the title at the end. <clears throat> Eyes not dotted a kitchen drawer slightly ajar, 
paint chipped at the edge of the door frame, a squeak from the bicycle chain, a leaf bent where the cat chewed it, an itch just out of reach between the shoulder blades, a chill you can't shake, an off smell in the refrigerator you can't pin down, fingerprints on your glasses, a loose thread on a button, fading daylight, remembering aubergine but not eggplant, a twinge behind the kneecap coming up the stairs, that funny numb spot on your finger, the corner under the desk that never gets dusted, the girl you were afraid to talk to in high school, the chocolate you shouldn't have had, distant sirens growing closer, a stopped clock, a pocket about to rip through, not meditating. <clears throat> Phone bank. <clears throat> At 8.15, we get a dance break. We take off our headsets and set down our scripts of indexed facts and canned anecdotes. Cool and the gang fill the boom box. We move to the beat around the crowded room, push Oreos and pretzels into our mouths and swap stories. The endless no answers and wrong numbers. The old people who can't hear us, the middle-aged people who won't, and the occasional success. Three songs in, the music ends. I go back to interrupting strangers' evenings, striving to be their instant friend and confidant, seeking common ground no matter how far it seems. I smile at the blank wall because they can hear if I don't. I have on my fireproof emotional suit, ready for the next irate Iron Ranger to rail against all you people and slam down the receiver. I push the button, mark next call. She said, <clears throat> she said that the trauma of yesterday had been too great. The confrontation with her friend, her former friend, with whom she had so much invested, who had turned on her, how could she have done such a thing? Had left her too drained to follow through on plans yesterday, had left her too drained to follow through on plans for today, made yesterday. She had to stay home, recuperate. She didn't have the energy to see anyone. She had ordered some furniture, a table and chairs that needed assembling. She wanted to stay home and assemble them for me so I would have somewhere to sit when she invited me over. And she very much wanted to invite me over to see her home, to meet her father, but I would need to sit somewhere. So she ordered furniture and Michael would help. He was good at those things. She needed to stay home and have Michael come by to help assemble the table and chairs. Michael, for whom she had only fraternal feelings now, though they had been lovers for several years and broken up unpleasantly. They were friends now, but no, she couldn't see me and no, she couldn't make plans. Why did I always need to make plans? Why couldn't I just do things at the spur of the moment? How dare I complain that this felt unfair to me? I should just try dumping my shit on her like that. I should just go ahead and try. I would find out who I was up against. How could I imply she isn't a good person? She is the most loyal friend in the world. She always tells the truth. She always keeps her word. Look how much she had invested in that woman who turned on her yesterday, who must have something terribly wrong with her. Leaving Northboro. My throat was so full of words that none could escape as Gail and I pushed Northboro away hard, further and further behind us. We left the duplex with the flooded basement, the attic fan that sucked insects through the screens, the cheap brown carpets, the loose newel post, the fool next door, his girlfriend, and his BMW out front. My station wagon and the rented trailer were filled with things too precious to trust to movers. We brought two ferrets, one dead from the freezer to bury, a carefully packed box of antique pottery and a dozen house plants I would kill out on the front porch of our new place, unloading the car in the cold. We left a mountain of rubbish on the deck from the final, final frenzy of packing and hoped our haulers would take it. I, gave, I told Gail her electric typewriter was still in the attic near the hatch and all she said was, yes. We brought pillows and blankets and contra contraceptive sponges. We left my acid reflux in the master bedroom 
with its windows at perfect eye level for the engineers of passing trains. We left our shouting matches, the floor stomped on and pounded with fists and the bitter silences that followed. We stared ahead through the windshield and waited for home to arrive. Two more. <clears throat> Grace Stafford. This is not about Grace Stafford, the voice of Woody Woodpecker, who had to use a stage name because audiences in the 1930s did not want stars named Grace Boyle. It's not about me riding around Lake of the Isles on a flat, cold morning, six or seven miles in, pedaling hard, seeing a flash of red on a tree. It's not about how Grace Stafford's voice went uncredited for eight years because people did not want their animated woodpeckers voiced by a woman. It's likely not about how the flash of red resolved into a pileated woodpecker in full profile view, only the second one I've seen. This could in no way be about movie theaters filled with woodpeckers, watching animated shorts full of ornithomorphized humans, wisecracking and pulling pranks, wings replacing arms, their toes ending in powerful talons so they could cling to trees like everyone. Most likely, this is about how cancer took Grace Stafford in 19, 20, 1992, how the woodpecker let out a penetrating cry, unfolded its huge unlikely wings and dove off to the north, how I clipped back into the petals and finished my ride. Last one. <clears throat> unfathomable crap. This poem is unfathomable crap, beyond editing, unworthy of reading, publishing, or reciting, of accolades, of odes to its profundity, or serious attempts at interpretation. This poem feels no shame. Your derision falls on deaf ears. It doesn't even care enough to taunt you back. Best to ignore it. Let it die of neglect. Let it stink like a fish. Let it curl and dry, then put it in the compost pile to frighten the unsuspecting. What the hell is that, they'll shriek, and drop their bucket of nice clean kitchen scraps as this poem stares up at them with its one empty eye, its half open mouth, and rows of tiny teeth seeking deeper meaning as it slowly turns back into thought energy that next time might turn out a little better. Thank you, Paul. That was Paul Mattis. Thank you. All right. That was Paul Mattis and our next reader is Chris Norbury. Chris is the award-winning author of the mystery suspense thrillers Straight River and Castle Danger. The stories feature Matt Lanier, a southern Minnesota farm kid turned professional musician whose middle-class world is turned upside down when he uncovers a conspiracy run by a powerful, ambitious, violent, real estate magnet. <clears throat> Chris's latest published work is a short story titled Killer Tacos, featured in Cooked to Death Volume 5, Restaurant in Peace. It's an anthology of crime mystery stories written by 14 Minnesota authors. Each story is related to food and restaurants and includes the recipe for a dish mentioned in the story. Chris grew up in the Twin Cities and earned a BS in music education at the University of Minnesota. He and his wife live in Oaxaca. He's a member of the Twin Cities and national chapters of Sisters in Crime and belongs to the Alliance of Independent Authors, Ali. Join me in welcoming Chris Norbury. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Paul, Carol, and Jane. I was a little bit apprehensive when I first was invited to speak since I'm the one novelist out of four readers tonight. And after hearing the three poets before me, all I can say is, wow, I really feel intimidated now. 
because some of those poems were outstanding and there's so many lines I wish I could rip off and use in my future uh, prose. Uh, I'm jealous of poets because they can often tell in a hundred words or so what I feel like it might take me a hundred thousand words to say. So I'm in total awe of anybody who can tell a story that briefly. Uh, my first selection will be um, from my first book in the series, Straight River. And I decided to go with um, uh, reading a, a turning point in the story, kind of a halfway point where things change for the good for, the, um, for Matt, the, the main character. And just to set up, uh, he's in the hospital after being almost killed in a house explosion. Uh, the other characters mentioned are, or in this are Dave, Dave Swanson, his best friend, uh, Clay, who is a cop, Flannery, who is the evil police chief, uh, Jack the dog, and then Saxony Partners is the uh, shell company owned by the evil rich real estate magnet conspirator. So here's this scene. A sharp knock on the door roused Matt from a doze. He turned his head toward the sound as Dave Swanson slipped into the hospital room. Grim-faced, with intense eyes, carrying a brown paper sack tucked under one arm, Swanson appeared to be as taut as piano wire. Time to get you out of here, Matty. His voice was low, but every bit as intense as his body. Huh? Matt still felt loopy from painkillers and the ringing in his ears. Swanson tossed the sack onto the bed. A pair of jeans and a blue flannel shirt spilled out. Put them on. Don't tuck the shirt in too tight. Leave it baggy so you don't look so much like your scrawny self. I'm springing your ass from this barless prison. What? Why? I can't leave. Matt raised his bandaged left hand. In case you forgot, I have some serious injuries. Swanson gave him a, how stupid you think I am look. You can't afford to wait until your boo-boos are all better, meathead. I came back and eavesdropped outside your room when Flannery was here yesterday. Then I was over to your place this morning talking to Clay when Flannery showed up again. Heard enough to know that he's got it in for you. A chill shot down Matt's spine. You think Flannery's serious about that crazy notion I blew up my own house? Paper said propane leak, but I got this sick feeling the explosion was no accident. I think you were supposed to flip the light switch. That means someone wants you dead because you're digging around in this real estate stuff. If the hit and run was the first try, this was the second. Since you survived, their next best option for shutting you down is to pin the blast on you. Matt flashed back to the aftermath of the blast when he saw the taillights of a vehicle driving away. He groaned. Of course, the SUV driver might have been close enough to detonate the explosion when he knew someone was inside, right after the light switched on. If Jack hadn't warned me, I'd be dead. That's one hell of a dog you got. Tell me about it. Has anyone found him yet? Swanson shook his head. We'll keep looking. Main thing is to get you out of here so you ain't a sitting duck. Sign yourself out against doctor's orders. They can't legally keep you here unless you're under arrest. Still confused, Matt sat up to take off his hospital gown. Swanson pulled an adhesive bandage from his pocket and unwrapped it. Pull your IV. I'll put this on your hand to stop the bleeding. After Swanson applied the bandage, Matt got dressed. Putting on socks and buttoning the shirt was painful and awkward with only one good hand. His pain was lessening, but still substantial. After putting on his blood-spattered running shoes, Matt stood and looked at Swanson. What's the plan? Go out through the north entrance. No security cameras there. I'll slip down the back stairs and drive around to meet you. Swanson pulled a twins baseball cap and sunglasses from his back pocket and tossed them onto the bed. Put these on after you sign out. Make sure no one gets a good look at your face. If you see any police, especially Flannery, duck into a room. Swanson flashed a furry grin and a thumbs up sign, then slipped into the hallway. Mac picked up the, sun, the hat and sunglasses and shambled toward the nurse's station. Julia Deason was sitting behind the counter. Her brow crinkled and her usually cheerful countenance drooped to a maternal scowl. Why are you out of bed and dressed? Though the pain, through the pain, he forced a smile that felt more like a grimace. I'm much better today. I need to get to an important meeting, so I'm checking myself out. Despite her vehement protest, Matt convinced Deason he was lucid and healthy enough to leave. Then he got into the elevator and donned the cap and sunglasses when he reached the main floor. Before exiting, he peeked out and glanced from side to side, scanning for police. He felt as if he were playing the role of some lowbrow secret agent in a high school play. 
As he stepped outside the north entrance, Matt spied Swanson behind the wheel of a Dodge pickup idling at the curb. He hesitated because Swanson owned a Ford. Puzzled, Matt struggled into the passenger seat, gasping as pain shot through his ribs. Where'd you get this truck, Swanee? Borrowed it from a trusted friend. Mine's parked a few blocks away. I didn't want anyone to see my truck at the hospital because I've got security cams watching the main entrance and front parking lots. We'll switch in a minute. Moments later, Swanson pulled into the parking lot of a deserted commercial building. They switched vehicles in seconds. While Matt fumbled for his seatbelt, Swanson zipped out of the lot. He took a sharp turn too fast and drifted across the center line before he corrected and narrowly averted a collision with an oncoming car. Matt gasped and grabbed the door handle. Damn, are you trying to save my ass just so you can kill me in a car accident? If I'm supposed to worry about Flannery, getting arrested for speeding won't help. Swanson didn't slow down. The sooner we get you out of sight of everyone, the better. Who's everyone? Flannery, the SUV jockey, Saxony Partners. Matt stiffened. How the hell do you know about Saxony Partners? I never mentioned that name to you. Swanson glanced at Matt, then focused on the road. His fingers were white from the pressure he exerted on the steering wheel. Until this afternoon, I worked for them. And that's that chapter of Straight River. The next piece is from my second book in the series titled Castle Danger. And this also stars Matt Lanier. He has had his life totally ruined in Straight River. And now he's just trying to survive the best he can. And um, one, uh, one of the things I was praised for in a, in a contest that I entered, the judges thought I did an excellent job of communicating a sense of place and there's no place that has more uh, sense of place to me than Northern Minnesota in the winter. So uh, see if you can get the feeling for this, even on this fairly balmy September day of what it might be like out here in the wilderness. Uh, this is the first chapter of Castle Danger. Matt's, Matt Lanier stood on the middle of Snowfall Lake, gasping for air, wobbling on his snowshoes. His leg muscles quivered on the verge of collapse. His pulse pounded like double-timed timpani beats in his chest and temples. Each icy inhale rasped his throat. Gusts of wind threatened to knock him off balance. If he fell, he doubted he could stand again, let alone walk. Micro diamonds of snow whirled across the open expanse of white and crackled against the hood of his parka. He'd hit the wall many marathon runners experienced after about 20 miles, except his wall was made of ice. The last few ominous measures of Box, Takata, and Fugue in D minor echoed in his brain. His choices were unequivocal, keep walking or die. If he'd ignored the emer emergency flare he'd seen and heard yesterday, he certainly wouldn't be risking his life for the stranger lying at his feet. Instead, he'd wrestled with his conscience a hundred times today about doing the right thing. He could leave the bleeding unconscious trapper here in the middle of the large oval-shaped lake in the heart of the Arrowhead region of Northeast Minnesota and quickly reach safety by himself. If wolves didn't feast on the remains or if a forest service plane didn't discover the body before ice out, it would sink to the bottom and no one else would ever know what had happened. He looked back at the mummy-shaped load on the makeshift sled tethered to his waist. Wisps of breath vapor rose slowly through a frosted patch of the black scarf covering the mummy's face. Incredulous, Matt snorted and shook his head. I'll be damned, he said to his cargo. Looks like we keep walking. The temperature felt like minus 20 Fahrenheit. The wind chill? Too cold to compute. Building a fire and shelter to warm up would take time he didn't possess. Since leaving his campsite in the pre-dawn light, He'd covered approximately eight of the, ten, of the 10 miles he needed to travel to reach safety. Sunlight reflecting off the crystalline snowpack stung his eyes as he gauged the angle of the impotent January sun, mid-afternoon. He'd badly miscalculated his travel time. Good plan, genius. Two hours of light, two miles to safety. Too much to ask of his body? After dropping his ski poles, he pulled off the Gore-Tex outer mitt and the insulated inner glove from, from his right hand. He fumbled in the outer pocket of his parka with stiff fingers for the last of his venison jerky. The few bites of dried deer meat comprised his only energy source for this final push. Crusted ice cracked off his ski mask when he opened his mouth. Chewing the jerky was easy once it broke into small icy meat chips. 
After eating the last salty but otherwise tasteless bite, he donned his glove and mitt. You damn well better stay alive, he said, angry at the man for intruding on his life, because I'll get royally pissed if I do all this work for nothing. His unconscious passenger replied with more breath vapors. Matt forced his body back into work mode and groaned from the exertion. He was almost ready to give up when the sled grudgingly moved from the deep powder. He took a step, then another, and he was underway. A feeling of triumph surged through him. With every step, he dreamed of warmth, rest, food, and gulping quarts of water instead of chewing handfuls of snow. He plodded on, fighting for balance as the raging northwest wind tried to topple him. He cleared the peninsula as the sun touched the tops of the tallest trees in the southwest sky. Shadows stretched across the snow-covered lake and deepened the green of the pines and the brown of the aspens and tamaracks, which in turn highlighted the white birches. Angling to the south, he finally got the damned wind out of his face. Although it was an enormous psychological boost, the, ta the tailwind added nothing to his speed. Matt intuitively set his course for the boat dock, still unseen through the whirls of loose powdery snow. He'd worked several summers for Ferdy Olson in high school and college, guided dozens of canoe trips, and knew his way back to this place as well as he knew the way back to any place he'd ever lived. Sweating now, he dug deep for extra energy and quickened his pace. The finish line of his marathon was in sight. Despite the sweat dampening his body, Matt couldn't remember the last time he hadn't been shivering. Rigid with numbness, his face felt like an ice mask. The wind continued to swirl microscopic snow particles into his eyes, blurring his vision. Above all, his stomach growled nonstop. He hadn't eaten a full meal since an early breakfast. Since then, he'd burned thousands of calories. Matt slogged on toward Olson's Outfitters, head down to maintain forward momentum. He estimated his remaining distance every few minutes, 1,000 yards. One yard equals two steps, 2,000 steps. He hummed Tchaikovsky's March Slav in an attempt to maintain a steady pace and because the title seemed appropriate for the situation. A faint outline of the main building, the lodge, appeared. Ignore the deadly cold. He hummed louder. Ignore the pain. 500 yards left. Rise above the agony. Balance. Breathe. He glanced back at his passenger. Dying ain't allowed today, pal unless what awaited Matt at Olson's was a cop with a nervous trigger finger. And Don, if I have time for one more short one, um, I just found out that uh, the first page of my book three, the, the next book in the series, won uh, a first page award through the uh, University of Wisconsin Writers Institute first page contest. Uh, which is kind of a big deal for us institute goers. Thank you. Somebody's clapping. They may be, maybe have been there if you've been. It's kind of a big deal, and it's it's validation that you've learned something about uh, writing. And this is still um, Matt Linear, his third book in the in the saga. Same bad guys, but uh, totally different setting and scene. Chapter one. If long dead Ludwig could have heard this street music version of Chuck Berry's rock and roll classic roll over Beethoven, he might have clutched the sides of his coffin and refused to move. Even so, the small crowd was digging the sound. Despite the two-man band's unpolished voices and thrift store instruments, they generated a solid groove and enough energy to get toes tapping and heads bobbing. A pair of well-dressed women seemed ready to bust some moves, and their two toddlers bounced up and down, awkwardly clapping. Jazzman had played the song on bass and guitar a hundred times each, so his musician's brain was on autopilot. That allowed him to do a little people watching behind an impassive performer smile. But when he spotted a bald man standing in the audience, autopilot switched off and sight reading mode switched on. 6'2", 250, broad shoulders, no discernible neck, menacing countenance, panic inducing. A twin? Although that man couldn't possibly be the man, brutal memories leaped to mind and set ja sent Jazzman's head spinning. His fingers, suddenly feeling like sausages, stumbled on the chords. Hypo, his drummer and lead singer, shot him a, shot him a puzzled look but kept playing. Jazzman silently cursed, refocused, and concentrated on forming each note. An interminable minute later, they ended the song with a rapidly strummed C9 chord over a drum roll and cymbal crash. He looked up, but away from Baldy, to acknowledge the enthusiastic applause. 
Unfortunately, his gaze landed on two Minneapolis police officers standing behind the crowd. Combined with seeing the bald man, the cop sighting put him over the edge. His adrenaline rush triggered flight mode. Nodding toward the police, Jazzman said to Hypo, I'm out of here. Hypo glanced at the cops. His shoulders slumped. Ah, gee, man, again? He gestured toward all the people standing in a loose semicircle around him. Lunchtime business crowd, serious coin. We can make us a killing here. Half the time it take anywhere else. To be continued. Thank you, Chris. Took me a moment to unmute myself there, sorry. That was great and congratulations on the first page award. So we'll look forward to more. So that was Chris Norbury. So I'd like to uh, thank all of you for joining us tonight and again thank our readers, Jane Dickerson, Carol Masters, Paul Mattis, and Chris Norbury. Next month, uh, our readers are Margaret Hasse, Ronald J. Palmer, Johnny Brigham, and Richard Terrell. Uh, Richard uh, has a book launch on Facebook Live for his new book, What Falls Away is Always, this Sunday from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Daylight Time, and you can look for richardterrell.com for details. So we're very happy that you've all been with us for this uh, midstream reading. And so, Paul, if you can find a way to open as many microphones as possible, <laughs> one by one, carry on a little bit of a conversation. And while he's doing that, uh, let's all visually, again, thank our readers, Jane Dickerson, Carol Masters, Paul Mattis, and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> an actual sound too. Wonderful. Hey. Hey. All right. Nice work. Thank you.